Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Exploring Consciousness Podcast. And welcome to another episode with your co-host, Donna Revita, and me, Natasha Williams. This podcast is a field guide for people who would like some help and guidance on their spiritual path. I introduce, review, and share consciousness in its many dimensions. This is for the curious adventurer who isn't afraid of asking for help. So dream, dare, and let's begin today's episode. Hello and welcome Exploring Consciousness podcast listeners. Welcome to the show. Very happy to uh, be here as we explore um, more topics and reach further dimensions. Very excited to uh, speak with our guest today. And our guest today is Dr. Bob Davis, and welcome to the show, Bob. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, both of you. Thank you for the invitation, Natasha and Donna. You bet. Thank so you, a reminder, um, listeners, to on our Monday con- podcast, I did a longer intro and more uh, contacts for Bob, but just real quick. After receiving his doctorate in the sensory neurosciences from the Ohio State University, Dr. Bob Davis served as a professor for the State University of New York for over 30 years, where he conducted research in the behavioral and neural sensory sciences taught and held many high-level administrative roles. More recently, he has turned his recent book, Unseen Forces, into a planned documentary entitled The Consciousness connection. Welcome, Bob. What we're going to do it, Bob, is we're going to alternate questions and Natasha's going to go first. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Well, I've been reading up, Bob, and I'm really excited um, to get started here. So let's begin. Um, I'd like, if you can, discuss some of the extraordinary experiences that may have led you to publish books, articles, and into this wonderful film entitled The Consciousness Connection. Give us some more detail, Bob. Upon retiring from the State University of New York, I, I thought I would settle down into, um, into a relaxing uh, many years of, um, of retirement, but I didn't find that to be the case. Uh, you know, I, One time, uh, my wife and I, upon walking in the in the beautiful country of Sedona, we looked up in the sky and we saw two orange orbs. And that certainly got my attention. That led me to write my first book, The UFO Phenomenon, Should I Believe? And I've always been a, an avid um, advocate with great st- longstanding interest in ufology. So I wrote it off to whatever. I simply did not comprehend what it could be, and um, but it did send me down the rabbit hole. Then, about two years later, I had a lucid dream. Never had one since childhood. I truly believed I was dying. It was so real and vivid, as they say. It woke me up, and it left me with a strong impression that my colleague in the lab, who I had a strong bond with, worked with for a long time, had passed away. I drove home that day not thinking about that connection, other than that that was a very scary dream. But when I walked into the lab that morning, uh, it, it, I could tell immediately upon looking at my colleagues' faces that she had passed. And she passed at the same time that I had the dream I later found out. That led me to writing my next book, Life After Death, an analysis of the evidence. I was I was convinced that, that in some way, through non-locality, possibly, she was sending me a message. It wasn't verbal, it wasn't visual but it was a sense of knowingness. Uh, And there were far too many coincidences associated with that incident to write it off to anything but something quite suggestive and significant. So I next had a spiritual awakening um, through some kind of mediumship technique by another individual uh, who was a shaman in some respects, a former um, physician. Uh, who, who developed some ability, don't ask me how, but she was able to induce effects in individuals that are simply unexplained. 
and after I gave a few papers in Australia one day, she invited some people up for wine and cheese. I went and she said, let's have a healing. We all sat around in a circle and then she started talking, remove your engrams, clean the energy, blah, blah, blah. I suddenly began coughing, couldn't stop. I went to un uncontrollable physical maneuvers. I felt bliss. I looked like I was suffering, but I felt wonderful. I really felt like it was a trans, um, you know, self-transcendent experience. Uh, and, and I felt, felt a sense of duality, like I was not my body. I felt a true distinguished um, position where I was looking down on my body, not exterior, but I could sense the independence of, of consciousness and body. It was doing its thing and my mind was experiencing bliss while my body was behaving in an uncontrolled manner. So that led me to the next book, Unseen Forces, The Integration of Science, Reality, and You. Long story short, it led me to co-production of the film with Dave Beatty and Wilson Hawthorne, The Consciousness Connection, which we're now producing. We completed the interviews. We're now in the uh, significant editing phase of the, of the project, crafting the final project, expecting it to be you know, finished by mid to late 2025. And we visited, you know, over two years, we interviewed 40 people, visited Monroe Institute, we, and we uh, went to the Institute of Noetic Sciences, Stanford University, Vine Center, International Associated for Near-Death Studies. And uh, we're trying to figure out what is consciousness? Does it originate from the brain? Does it persist after death? I mean, my experience has led me to this. It turned me into a tree hugger. It flipped me. It made, it made me less egoic, as it does for many people who have these kinds of, let's call them, for lack of a better term, spiritual awakenings. Um, I, I have a long way to go, but I, I'm, I'm further along the path or down the rabbit hole than, than, than I was before, as it's all relative, of course. Uh, but... Um, I see the world differently as a result of all these experiences and my research. So, Bob, you bring a unique set of skills and experiences to our podcast. But my question to you, Bob, is can you discuss more about shared death experiences and how they differ from near death? Because you'd be the first one talking about shared death on our show. It's, a, it's an interesting question because... In my mind, the shared death experience is actually more important than the near death experience in terms in terms of of providing validity to the overall experience, if if that was what we wanted to do. And and I and I do believe that we have a, a means of looking at the phenomena objectively, where an individual, independent of someone else's having a near death experience, goes through that shared death either senses that the person is dying, like I did, may visualize the person transitioning, hear the person verbally saying goodbye. A group of relatives may see smoke, steam rise from the body as, as a dying individual continues on. So an SCE, shared death and death experience, while they share many common traits, of course, and the, the encounters with the, the, the spirit beings, deities, the perception of the transcendent light and life reviews of the sense of unity that we all describe, the, the tunnel, the gateway, all of that. Uh, the main difference is that people who are actually very physically close to, the, to those who are dying, emotionally that is, um, uh, experience in some way the dying person's passing. And it provides, you know, one, one can't therefore question, well, that experience is due to a, a faulty brain in the process of dying, and thus there's confusion, hallucination, giving rise to the, to the symptoms that we're describing when people have NDEs. No, we're not talking about that, because we're talking about healthy brains, independent individuals who are also sensing what the NDE is experiencing. That's a critical perception, an independent objective verification of the process, whereby people can be 
miles apart without any communication, yet one is able to sense the dying of the other. And there's many instances of this, of course. Uh, call up uh, a brother or, or a relative and said, I just got a message that, that our dad passed, only later to find out that that was the case. Or one receives a message to avoid danger um, from someone beyond. That's an after-death communication. Um, you know, they come in so many different varying ways, whether it's after death, within a year from passing, or at the, at the time, or soon, very soon thereafter, an individual passes, does some form of communication occur, which could prevent danger uh, occurring to the living individual, uh, or a sense of love and, and thank you from the dying. Um, and not not everybody has these kinds of experiences. They're often very subtle and and un, go on unnoticed. But many people, for whatever reason, do. And we can only take their word for it. At least science can only take their word for it at, at present until we can develop some techniques to possibly verify it, at least more objectively. Let's do a follow-up question for you. So do you see an evolution in the research? I mean, we're only talking, we're talking about Raymond Moody life after life, just recently you're talking about like 30, 40 years of, of research. Do you feel, because there's all these different types, do you feel like research is finely catching up to it? Research is, is highly dependent upon uh, those that develop hypotheses to explain the kinds of questions that you're just asking. Problem is, that's the scientific method. The problem with that is that it follows Newtonian science largely um, and thus is quantifiable. It applies to the physical universe. So we're only limited in our search for answers along the lines you're, you're posing to just the brain the neurotransmitters and, and, and the 100 billion neurons and associated synapses for answers. I don't think the answers lie there. I think I the answers... Either. Yeah, the answers are really non-physical. So we're, he we're held hostage by our current modern-day scientific you know, standards, techniques. A Newtonian science doesn't apply. It's going to take a long time. You know, science advances one funeral at a time, as Eugene Wigner said, um, uh, noted laureate th theoretical physicist. Uh, this, and we need to advance our understanding of consciousness and, and possibly some unseen force like consciousness and beyond to better understand what this all means. Um, so uh, much more can be said. Many theories are applied. Uh, whatever the answer is, is probably has to do with uh, quantum processing at some level. The brain is a quantum processor. Uh, it is. It's the only way we can justify its capabilities. Um, you know, computers the size of the country couldn't do what the brain is capable of doing. Uh, nevertheless, we we it, it, in order to better understand what we're talking about here is to do it uh, to catch up with science is is to understand the quantum processes of the brain and possibly even to look at the brain or humans as being light beings. You can truly make the case, at least preliminarily, that we are light beings and and i say that because if you look at the brain the brain is largely composed of of magnetite uh, these are chemical ele elements that have geomagnetic properties and responsive to magnetic magnetic stimulation and we see glial cells also in the brain also behaving in 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 this manner um the the, the point is you can make a you can make a strong case that biophotons in neurons in the brain, based on you know Hammerhoff's and Penrose's orchestrated reduction theory, actually emit light and act as quant the act as quantum computers. And there's a lot of association with respect to current research, not applying to Newtonian physics in, in most respects that are highly suggestive of the brain being a quantum computer. It, it engages with other neurons within the brain using the processes of quantum physics, like entanglement, superposition. And it can emit light energy in the form of biophotons 
conveyed conveyed like a conveyor belt that goes instantaneously from one place to another like electrons you know via the process of entanglement um immediately automatically and when this happens when this happens you can make a strong case for extrasensory perception being being in the form of light energy emitted from the brain and received by another brain in the form of light energy with elements and chemicals and cellular material that are receptive to and generate light energy in between and i mean that we're at the very preliminary stages uh highly theoretic but you can make a a, a, a strong suggestive case that's worthy of theoretic of theoretic ex, uh, experimental exploration I have theories, and I know a few other neuroscientists that have similar theories. Um, so we may be at some at at some point in time we may be able to justify non-locality ESP. A lot of the extraordinary human experiences we have, proving that we live in a quantum world, which it, in itself is spooky. You know, qu quantum function is is spooky, as Einstein said, spooky action at a distance. So you answered my question in terms of how it's evolving non-locally, you know, like the, the shift change of Newtonian scientific methodology. You know, you're answering that. But uh, why we wait in joyful hope as one scientist dies at a time, my question would be, can we change some of the evidence based on, for example, on the reincarnation of children? Does that fall under sheer death or near death? For example, the six-year-old that was uh, speaking of his life as a World War II pilot, very famous case, where that uh, I know that proves reincarnation. Does that is that going to is that kind of evidence going to be used in shared death or near death or just what you just answered? It's going to be yeah, the evolution when quantum catches up. Donna, Donna, it's an excellent question. And and it poses one that that applies to many lines of evidence in the realm of these extraordinary human experiences like ESP, um, mm -hmm. out-of-body experiences, near-death, psychedelic experiences, spiritual awakenings, even U UFO interactions with and, and interactions with non-human intelligences. I mean, it's a, it's a wide spectrum here that we're talking about. When you talk about re recall of past lives, which Ian, Ian Stevenson did major research in, um, he at the end of his research said that of all the hundreds of cases that he studied he came away saying that his evidence was highly suggestive of reincarnation he never said it proved it although in most of his cases children five to eight years of age were able to accurately recall details of their prior life in a in a previous existence in an area close to where they resided now right did, did did the deceased at that time who lived at that time actually communicate that information to the child and the child then relayed that to parents etc there are other possibilities and these possibilities also exist in other lines of research not only unique again to to past life recall why can't it be um possibly an after death communication could be I don't think so, but it could be. Uh, and and if so, if so, that's quite significant. <laughs> that's that says something pronounced about reality, about life after death in and of itself. No matter what we call it, right. you know, could it be a e ESP of some type where where that event took place? You know that that time and space um, exists somewhere in the in the ethos, right in the akashic record. Uh, where every event, past, present, and future, is recorded, as, as some Nobel laureates uh, in theoretical physicists, physics ascribe to, this universal field, semantic field. Um, and is that, are children retrieving some of that information that just exists because of the laws of reality and nature that we're unaware of now, but may be, may, may be true? Uh, there are other possibilities. So you can't say again, and Ian Stevenson was quite wise as a scientist in saying it suggests above rather than conclusively proves. Don't stick your neck out on the line. 
uh, to many, it does conclusively prove. I would say highly suggest of both. I appreciate that. It's it's like the experiences are kind of catching up to some research and vice versa. We're starting to catalog uh, a large range of a continuum of these experiences. And that might lead into Natasha's question. I, I want us to go back. You had mentioned um, a concept of vertical perception. And can you speak a little bit more on that? Give me, um, if you could, uh, details and maybe some examples of how that would look with near-death experiences. You know, the vertical perception is probably the, the home run, the, the hallmark of research as far as near-death uh, experiences are concerned. Uh, and, and they also exist in shared death experiences too, as we mentioned. So here, here again, we're talking about observations or, or experiences that are later verified as accurate even when the person um, is going through their near-death experience and deemed to be clinically dead or unconscious. Near death, of course, they're not dead, dead, they're retrieved, obviously. So they encounter the deceased in some way that they're not aware of that may have passed and then inform others that that person that they were unaware of died. And that later was verified to be true. Um, classic story was given to Dave Betty again, my, my co-producer and, and, and I by Bruce Grayson when we attended the International Association for Near-Death Studies in Washington, D.C. This, this past fall. He told us a story whereby, now I'll probably get a few, some of the details um, um, uh, mixed up here, but when he first began his internship, he said he, he met a, a, um, a resident, not a resident, a patient who he was treating. And uh, he, he said that he had a near death experience during his asphyxiation. And he told um, Dr. Grayson the story of how he had been um, taken care of by a young nurse who worked with them every day for a few weeks. And then this nurse named Anita told him that she was going out for a long weekend and that another nurse would be substituting. So she left and while she was gone, he had another respiratory arrest, which led to his other near-death experience. And while he, during his near-death experience, he claimed to have met Anita. And he says to her, of course, what are you doing here? You know, and, and, and she said, Jack, you, you need to go back. Find my parents and tell them I love them very much. And I'm sorry that I wrecked their red MGB. Now, this was back in the 70s in South Africa. And, I, and there likely weren't many MGBs being driven there at the time. So when Jack awoke and, and he started to tell the nurse that he saw um, Anita and she she um, he conveyed the information that Anita did during his NDE and then that nurse got so upset she cried and ran off Jack later found out that Anita took the weekend off so cele oh. celebrated her 21st birthday and you got it she was given the gift a surprise gift for her 21st birthday of a red MGB that she crashed on her test drive into a telephone pole. And she, she died hours after crashing uh, before he had his near-death experience. So there's, there's really no way you could have known at the time that she had died and certainly um, how she had died. And, and yet he did. So, so you get these kinds of stories um, that are quite convincing. Um, Another one from Jeff Long, and I'll do this quickly. He, he, he had a patient who was blind from birth. And there's been a few studies done with blind people from birth who have near-death experiences. And they claim to have 360 vision, as mm -hmm. most people do. Donna, you may have had 360 vision. You're not limited by your eye sockets. So when he was talking to this, this individual who was blind from birth, her name was Vicky, um, he explained to her, no, our eye sockets only allow us to see, you know, in the front or the sides, 180, you know, pie shaped. And she she contended, no. Now, how would she have known? 
not not only about her sight if she wasn't again impeded by her disordered visual system in her body which apparently was was unimpeded during her nde surprisingly how would she have known that it was 360 view which is consistent with others who have an near-death experience you know, we, we, there are many experiences like this i can you can go on and on you 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 can hear this in one shape or form or another we we, we interviewed Eben Alexander, the uh, very um, well-known neurosurgeon who wrote the famous book, um, Proof in Heaven, about his vertical perception. And very briefly, again, he, he met a woman who, who was on a butterfly in a beautiful pastoral field. And while floating on the butterfly with her, she told him information about her that she was his sister before she had passed and information about parents and the family that he didn't know. But when he recovered and shared that information with the parents, they were stunned because they never told him that they had, that he had a sister who had died prior to him being born. For some reason, they didn't, never shared that with them. Now, again, a vertical perception, and, and there's more to it. So what do you make of that? Again, Newtonian physics can't wrap, wrap its hands around that. Um, we need certainly a paradigm shift in, in the worst possible way to, to fully understand what's going on here. And the concept of consciousness comes into play. Information exchange, in other words, it's what's going on. And to me, that's what consciousness is, information exchange. And we see this at every level from the microscopic, atomic, to the cosmological. The gravitational forces, the dark energy, compelling you know, activity in space to do its thing through communication in one way or another that's understandable to the parties that be. The body, of course, communicates within itself in the most complex ways continually. We see it at all levels. We also see, however, communication non-locally. But that's not recognizable yet. And that's where I'm going. Consciousness is something that is the mystery, you know, the subject, subjective aspect of consciousness. And we get at it when we talk about these vertical perceptions. Um, can't prove it to science, but it points us certainly in more than more than using hints alone that this is where we should look in in a, in a sort of paranormal realm. I mean, I mean look, we, what we used to think in the old paradigms, we used to think that the sun revolved around the earth. And if you thought otherwise, that was considered paranormal. Well, likewise, we talk about ESP and other external human experiences in the same way through outdated eyes that will later be changed by open-minded futurists that are able to develop new new theories that prove consciousness is a unique force of nature that and and non-locality esp among many other things possibly life after death at some level that's probably not a good way to express it but some form of being you know that concept of me is continual um, and altered at the same time. But again, we're not held hostage by our brains and associated sensory systems where our perception of reality, as we know, is limited. We understand that. You, you, you understand that better than I. You were, in a, you were in a world where you weren't limited by your brain. People always ask me questions, Bob, about how I was prior to my near death and what happened after, as if we could do a compare and contrast if that was more than anecdotal. So for me, I can I can say um, there's nothing in my brain or my experience that I saw over there. And a lot of times people will say, well, you saw what you expected to see based on your cosmology. And that wasn't true for me. So the, the cosmology that I saw and I experienced was nothing that I knew. There was no, there were concepts, there were even concepts there that we can't explain here, like the difference, like you said, between time and eternity, that seems to be linear and sensual. 
you know, I didn't wasn't limited by senses. I wasn't limited. So the things I saw and heard, I, I didn't have any concept for. So to come back and try to explain that conceptually is difficult. So we try to do, well, what, what kind of abilities did you have prior to? Well, since I was four, I was able to sense, you know, extrasensory sense my guardians. And I have anecdotal evidence throughout my life. But when I come back, I come back and I'm able to do uh, more psychic powers, remote viewing. I didn't do remote viewing prior to my NDE. I'm remote, remote viewing now. So did, did crossing the veil, it, it would be a good study for scientists to say, you know, like uh, Dr. Gregson and his work or PMH Atwater and her work. And we did um, interview Eben on our podcast here. But is there is there something different that we can see abilities prior uh, versus abilities after? Like, I, I don't know that I would be able to remote view prior to that experience or my abilities to um, have the veil between worlds very thin so that I'm constantly aware of my guides and getting information. So is it after, you know, what about after life experiences or experiences on the other side, giving me information? So I find that very transformative. So it leads to the question, even though I just gave mine, how are why people transformed by these experiences? What did you, what did you find out in your film? What do you, what are you going to give us about th these transformative experiences and changed abilities? Well, it's been certainly well documented that well documented that these extraordinary human experiences, especially with near death experiences, and maybe because people come close to death, so it's, it's a little bit more emotional in content. Um, they are more um, impacted behaviorally, you know, psycho spiritually, uh, especially over time, than than others. And the question is, why do they become more humane in in general? And and we understand certainly all the all the ways in which they do behaviorally and in their perspectives and belief systems in life that are dramatically altered from that moment forward, especially as they they become more truth seekers, more spiritually minded. They read more about it uh, and learn more in the process. Maybe meditate more and engage in more spiritual practices, which also helps them in their quest and helps in the transformative process, especially if they get the proper support. And that's that's always critical um, to, to derive that because in many cases with these near-death experiences, um, it's not all fun and games. Uh, and, you know, people forget that, um, let's see, uh, about 10 to 20% in a, in a varied studies, and about three, four, five studies have been done, not with small populations, have a hellish near-death experience. It, it's a terrible experience for them. And they come away with it with a, a, a really a form of a, a, a pure PTSD. You know, we forget about that. And if we look at about 10 to 15 percent, which is a good incident statistic, well documented, out of 200,000 people alone in the United States who have NDEs, it's a lot of people. And a lot of those people are not getting properly counseled for a lot of reasons. Fear of stigma, for one. Um, a lot are. And a lot aren't explaining, maybe, in great detail why um, for fear of ridicule. But, yeah, why? People lose their ego. I, I, do, I do see that. They, they, you know, when they have these experiences, for some reason, there's a sort of disinhibition process that occurs and the question is, is that purely biochemical in nature or is that external to the body, more symbiotic with the mind and something beyond? Uh, the, the, the question is, why do people lose their ego to the point where the world no longer revolves around them? They revolve more around the world. And there have been few studies that have shown that people indeed flip, be becoming tree huggers, which I became right after my my you know experience called a kundalini or spiritual awakening i truly felt interconnected with my world don't ask me why but that sense of com compilation not compilation, compassion uh with life forms like you can't put into words donna what what you experienced perceptually the essence of 
in your experience i can't explain what i experienced in mine and that's the hard problem with consciousness trying to find in the brain where that is specifically coded for where do we get the subjective effort, essence of that desire to hug the tree go down the spiritual journey uh, make that decision i want to go down the rabbit hole in other words you know that the, the free will we don't understand at all where it is clearly coded for in the brain that sense of i me uh so that's the hard problem and the major controversy at hand yeah, i just have a, a question kind of piggybacking on that for those of us who um, have not experienced uh an, an nde and maybe no desire to uh how does how does one um gather what you have gotten in these extraordinary experiences so you you've come back with um these new abilities the, the the veil is thinner you can interact your your ego is gone you're a tree hugger like how how does one such as myself and maybe a lot of people who haven't experienced an nde how do we get how do we get closer to that meditate 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 listen to podcasts like this uh, do whatever you can to to resonate find things that resonate with you that are a little bit more spiritual in nature uh, that may go a little bit more beyond the grain that might you th that might open your eyes a little bit to the possibilities of the power of the mind mm -hmm. uh, like maybe going to monroe institute for uh, an educational experience about what they have to offer um mm -hmm. and and um read books on the topic about near-death experiences etc a lot of people go in the area of psychoactive drugs and magic mushrooms i don't propose i'm not a proponent of that there's many risks associated with that but a lot of people contend that that's one way you know to experience what the tree hugger is saying here which i'm not anymore but it, it dissipated but i i i'm different in a more positive way uh, maybe that's integrated, but I uh, to each to each his or her own, you know, yoga, whatever it might be. But yeah, a lot of people after all of these experiences, many claim to become psychic healers. Many, you know, many start seeing orbs. Many start seeing ghosts. Communicate a lot of uh, what we again call paranormal. Why is that veil lifted? It, it, it's hard to explain some of the theories because they are just that. You know, I hate to start advancing theories, and I have, without any firm corroborative supporting evidence. And when we go into the realm of conscious uh, quantum theory, uh, that's always a source of controversy. Yet there's much of it that is proven to be true, where actualities, you know, occur as a result of possibilities, and you have that ability. People, I think, in the future will realize that they have a lot more power than they ever imagined um and if they're going to be fine-tuned cultivated early in life something i think we all have a sense of but some of us for some reason have greater ability why are some people born um with remarkable talents uh, uh, some autistic savants you know who can do figure out the answer to cubic you know what's a cube root of a number off the top of their head in seven seconds without having any prior math exposure how is that a, a possible uh, we we see extraordinary events in, in all walks and shapes and sizes of life so uh, how can people who not have these experiences come to a better understanding of, of in a sense what we're talking about you can't until you certainly have something that knocks your socks off or that that makes you question reality What's going to make you, Natasha, question reality? Well, what may make you may not make the other person, but something that makes one and one equals three. What it takes, I don't know, but it's often along the lines we're talking about. And once you experience it, then you get it. It, mm -hmm. it, it The morning coffee tastes very different the next day. Mm -hmm. And it leaves you with, a, it's a type of PTSD, but one that... We, creates a fierce determination and that's what i had a fierce determination after each extraordinary experience and it culminated 
in the development of the film at, at consciousnessfilm.info for those that would like more information about it. Um, and thank you all for, for your interest and support of the film. It it um, it takes. I forget the the, the line of, of line of questioning, but it takes one uh, to experience it more than anything. You know, you talk to you talk to uh, Evan Alexander, a, a, a staunch materialist, and during our interview, he'll, he'll say just that. I, I was so I was such a materialist before I had my NDE. You, you couldn't talk me out of it otherwise, mm. uh, and now it's the complete opposite. He he routinely talks about spirituality and near death experiences and advocates strongly for just what we're talking about the mind brain relationship and how consciousness doesn't reside exclusively in the brain but consciousness is primary and when we talk to leading researchers like Grayson, uh, Bruce Grayson and Jeff Long and Diane Powell and uh, uh, Tom Campbell who you just had on your show. Uh, made my head spin, but in a very positive way. He's brilliant. Uh, who worked with Bob Monroe in the development of hemisync technology and the out-of-body experience. You know, we'll be talking about here. Mm -hmm. Very curious, because we're, we're talking about those who have experienced um, near death. They've come back. They're transformed. What I'm curious about, Bob, is have you ever been introduced or maybe spoke with somebody who had a near-death experience and didn't come back with extraordinary uh, information. They were unchanged, in fact. I like that question because it, it really gets at the heart of the matter, uh, how, uh, whether or not an, an NDE uh, you know, causes um, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, are, there, are there enough psycho-spiritual alterations that are, that are occurring uh, when people are having these these unimaginable experiences that are largely positive behaviorally, but it facilitates this new a newfound way of viewing the world, one's life and one's reality, whether it's positive or negative, as we, as we mentioned earlier, and and we're talking about a large percent of people, ten to fifteen percent of two hundred thousand people. A year alone in the United States. So, you know, if you, you got to do a survey of all those people, whatever, the, you know, 20, 30,000 or so, to really pre and post in order to really answer, you, you know, your question sure. with accuracy. Sure. But it's worthy of studying because we know that it's largely positive, but there's a lot of negative too. So, so, People do have both. Okay, how about the people that are neutral? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't spoken to enough, uh, and, but those I have spoken to, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking, given the question, you, you know, 10, mm -hmm. they've all been changed in some way. Again, it's via language and speech. How do you get into their head to, to really assess how much They've changed in what ways, but then when they talk about how they change, you know, you get a sense long enough about how they change, especially when in our conversations with those that we interviewed for our film, especially at the near death um, studies conference in Washington, it, you see that they flip as mm -hmm. flip in a positive way, as Jeff Kripal called it in his book, The Flip. And he interviewed about 60 scientists who had these kinds of extraordinary experiences ranging from near death to flying saucers to unimaginable experiences and how they flipped generally again positive now serving humanity doing better things that they than they did before in many ways and it's beautiful ways and we saw um my, my friend marjorie wolicott she's a neuroscientist at, at uh, washington university she did a study with 60 scientists who who had similar kinds of reactions and many of them actually claim to have seen a bright light you know coming down or, or emanating from themselves during their spiritual awakening call it a kundalini awakening or, or whatever but that alone you know is is life altering uh, but here again it shifted their perspectives and they many incorporated a, a, a new method of teaching that was more humanistic 
more holistic, more, more student-centered in nature. Whatever they did in their profession uh, was enhanced in, in, a, in a natural, better way. And I can't, I can't describe it other than to say it was for the good. They became more humane. So, you know, it's something that, yeah, it must be assessed greater without question. And along those lines, since I said, we need desperately a more thorough analysis of the semantic and somat thematic um, evidence of mm -hmm. all of this. And, you know, what are these people describing when they're having these experiences? Besides, I see a tunnel, I see, I see God, I see Uncle Harry, blah, 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 blah. That's great. We need to hear that. But what are they experiencing? If you understand what I'm trying to get at, as best as possible, try to capture the essence through language alone. And that can't do it. You, it can't. So how best to get at it? Well, we can't we can't measure that area in the brain. You see, when I say I met the I met the deity or I felt I saw the light during my NDE and I was changed in a profound way and I'll always be good and I'll, I'm, you know, that kind of thing. You can't see that in the brain. So you can't correlate how my subjective transformative experience, me, I, consciousness, with neurophysiologic activity. You see? so And that's important. Uh, indicating we got two different things going on here, physical and non-physical. We have memory. We can't even find memory in the brain. Memory to certain things. We can't. You know, you know, raise a hand. I, I, I stimulate this area. You know, this happens. This happens. It's more um, motor memory, right? It, you know, more that than than more complex memory uh, mm -hmm. that gives rise to complex cognitive thought and insight, and the aha moment that Einstein had when he thought of the theory of relativity. Or that, what allowed, uh, what, what was his name, uh, 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 Dimitri, I forget how to pronounce his name, to, to become one of the greatest mathematicians ever, despite having learned anything about math. Uh, the, well, I forget the other guy's, the other person's name, who said he developed the periodic tables in a dream. Yeah. Edison said this, similar things. We all know that. But it's interesting, though, to, how, how to find out. And Steven Spielberg said that. Well, they had talents to begin with. Let's face it. They had that brain, the, the ability the, uh, to to help facilitate those spectacular ideas. But maybe that's a, a, how, how moments come. Brilliant ideas come as a process of evolution from one's own mind. You know, you know What we could be looking at here, all of this is an evolutionary event of humanity. It's just the way we evolve spiritually. And the orbs and the UFOs, whatever you want to call that interaction, they're real. They're here. Uh, we could talk for hours on that. I have great interest in that area. It gets geopoliticized and terribly um, nuanced with bullshit baffling brains and cover-ups and disinformation that you know, it turns me off to the point where it turns me off. But I, I you know, we focus on the NDEs and past life recall. That's part of it too. I can I can go on and on about that phenomenon, which I wrote an article about. I was published in the Journal of Scientific American uh, with um, others as was a member of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation when we did study over three thousand individuals on individuals who claim to interact with UAPs and non-human intelligences. I think the government is starting to look at those kinds of phenomenon given the case of Chris Bledsoe out of the Carolinas and what yeah. what his what he's seen. Well and so I, I think people are taking it a little more serious, do you think? Well agencies that are looking at it, but it's been looked at for many, many, many decades. They they know all about this and and the so-called consciousness connection between I do believe non-human intelligence and and human beings uh, that are operating in the craft, whether or not we have it, them or it, the craft itself, or beings in possession, who the heck knows? But but I've I've talked to too many people, read too many from pertinent sources that all clearly clearly indicate that that this is going on, and um, I could have predicted the the recent uh, outcome released by. Arrow in the report that they have no evidence of, of extraterrestrial intelligence visiting Earth. 
Well, they may not at this time. I doubt that that's true. Um, either they're very poor researchers or they're lying about the evidence that they do have or both, and I do believe it's both. So, of course, they're not going to admit to it. I could, it's obvious from the very beginning they're not going to. We have to evolve as a society in order for the government to eventually admit that this is indeed the case. It, it is an evolving process, but I do believe we are. You know, the fact that, that we're even mentioning this on TV and holding congressional hearings, although we did back in the 60s, but in the way we are, there's a little bit more, a little bit more transparency than before, but not much more. But that alone shows at least a little bit more acknowledgement uh, and a little bit more evolution on the part of the powers that be, the science that is, with respect to what we consider to be paranormal. But in order to understand what's normal, we do need to understand the paranormal. That's a big yeah. message of Tom Campbell of this, the paranormal will soon be normal. And, it's, and it is citizen scientists, there is the IONS, I -O -N -S, the Edgar Mitchell Noetic Studies, and then the IONS. My concern is like for Natasha, those that haven't had that experience, they hear about spiritually transformative and near-death experiences and wondering how, what they can do. And Bob said meditation, and it sounded so uh, easy, but it, it's to get, it's really to open up on the veil. So reading books about it and doing your meditation is is really important. And we are shifting the consciousness of the planet. And based on all this evidence, can you, you do you feel like you've already spoken and made the case for the paradigm shift? Yeah, and uh, the theoretical physicist Eugene Wigner said science advances one funeral at a time. And that, that, that's, that's a commonly used frame. It, it's a slow process. And it takes about 100 years or so before there, there's a major change. And it's occurring, you know, we saw it with the discovery of germs and and carbon dioxide emissions, I think, is, is it sort of paradigm shift. And, and, and we have it now, I think, to some extent with AI. Uh, but I think the paranormal, so to speak, should also be a major paradigm shift because the implications are, are profound, uh, I think, in terms of individuals and society and how it could impact individuals and society in, in a positive way, uh, health-wise, spiritually, psychologically. And and we know that these paradigm shifts, they, they, they it's needed. You know, they're acknowledged anomalies of the time that, that simply don't fit uh, the paradigm of the time. And, and we have that with these extraordinary human experiences. So, so they're rejected entirely, they're debunked, they're ignored. Uh, and many, however, in academia, and I'm seeing this through my, my discussions with people as part of producing the movie and through interviewing many scholars in, in, for our film, I'm seeing this shift away of, by many from academia to studying certain aspects of the paranormal. I mean, there are psychologists, uh, physicists, neuroscientists, on and on, who have had these kinds of experiences, are writing about it, and are conducting now research about it, because they know it's going to be uh, more accepting by their colleagues. I was very hesitant when I wrote my book uh, on UFOs, uh, how it would be perceived by my colleagues, only then to be later in a sense, exonerated, I think it's not a good term, by the fact of, of the acknowledgement by the government, the DOD, of its validity. You know, in, look, even Columbia University, I, uh, I forget her name, Janet Miller, uh, she runs a program, a graduate program for her students on what? Spirituality. You, you know, um, not, not getting at specific NDEs, OBEs, but spirituality, meditating, mind, body, healing, uh, related aspects to it. Uh, people do their thesis, do doctoral dissertations on these topics now. I, you know, I've read many. And, you know, so people are getting educated more early on about it, listening to podcasts about just this, um, thousands daily. 
And that alone is contributing to a paradigm shift, probably probably more rapidly than we think, given the the exponential fashion and popularity of social media in all its complexity, and, and if I may say, um, annoyance <laughs> in many ways. You know, you know, we get bombarded by too much information. At least I do at, at times. But we need a paradigm shift because what we're talking about is non-physical in nature, and because non-Newtonian physics doesn't address non-physical aspects of our universe, it's inconsistent with it. So we have to we have to eventually develop hypotheses that will help to prove whether or not the brain is interrelated with consciousness. I don't think it is, but how do you prove it? Okay. Uh, how, do, how do you study like Jill Bolt Taylor when her left brain shut down due to a stroke and she just perceived reality with only her right brain, which she described as an epiphany. And she encouraged everyone to sense it. She felt love, interconnectedness, as we're talking about, the beauty of it all. I like what you're uh, saying, Bob. Um, on this podcast, if you think about the people that you're talking to move this forward, on this podcast, we have interviewed Evan Alexander, Jeffrey Mishlove, who is the only doctor holder of the uh, parapsychology doctorate on the planet, Tom Campbell, yourself as a neuroscientist, Paul Smith as a part of the, um, I hate to say psychic spies, but he's done uh, his doctorate on consciousness. So to hear, like you said, to hear our podcasts, I think is moving it forward makes me feel good about our podcast and who we've interviewed well look that you know we talk about spiritual evolution you know our society is going through evolution spiritually that is and social media is helping greatly to to promote it why what did, what did your nde serve it it served a purpose for you as an individual in the ways that you write and talk about it but but more importantly maybe than that what did it serve? How many people have you shared your experiences with? How many people have you ha had on your show to share their perspectives on it that have benefited others in so many ways to this point where you're still getting um, input from, from the public for your assistance in, in some way or another? That's what right. your NDE, you know, that's it. Right. And it, it compounds, you know, right. it, uh, uh, geometrically. So that has to continue, but but look, you know, the bottom line is we see, I think, is we see these transformations in people from their extraordinary experiences. It occurs overnight. It, it's generally facilitates very positive after effects in the form of ego dissolution, better companionships, humaneness, things we talk about, things we keep hearing. Um, but it's critical. But the point is, there's no other way of producing such profound changes in people's lives, physically and mentally, so quickly, in the blink of an eye, like these events do. The point is, psychotherapy, medicines, etc., you know, they may help, they may not, but and they admit it, physicians will admit it, they can't, they don't derive the same benefits in their patients that these external human experiences can in the way they do. And so there's something to that. They acknowledge that the medicine community is beginning to understand that. And you alluded to just earlier, hospice workers, caretakers of the critical ill, they're becoming more sensitive to not only terminal lucidity, but also to, to end near-death experiences. They are. And 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 they realize that it's a real event. I mean, it's tons of research on NDE on NDEs in scientific literature. The question is just what I just asked. The major question: Why does it change them so dramatically, so quickly, overnight, when medicine can't? And not only does it make us more, we develop more ESP. You know, we we more psychics have more spiritual experiences of the like. And so that's, that's something else, I think. You know, the science is not looking at that, but that is certainly a component of it. You know, they, they, they first, first want to figure out why do they get healthier? Why do they lose fear of death, that anxiety? 
and, and, and many do, although they first have to get over their, their experience integrated, don't you see? But they feel more confident that they understand reality better based on the experience. They, they, they feel like they get it now. They feel like there definitely is an afterlife, whatever that may mean to them, nothing to fear. You know, these things were acknowledged, not to the extent they were looked at like um, awe-inspiring moments okay, where you see a beautiful scene in the, the Grand Canyon and you're struck deeply, you know, magnificent. You, you, don't, you can't find that impact in the brain. It exists and it's real and it's permanent and possibly permanently transformative to the person, especially if it is traumatic. Uh, it, it's all it's it's making sense because it's like right now we can't capture it, it it's not like we can capture and pinpoint right so there's still like in my head there's still a lot of flailing about in terms of because i like concrete i like analytical um i want to be able to um touch feel investigate and it's it's you know it's not tangible i can't i can't feel it yet well, feel it yet well that's that's been greatly my frustration i've been a staunch you know materialist scientist mm -hmm. materialist in the form of i i need to see the data and analyze it prove, prove uh, statistically the hypothesis yeah so i struggle with all of this greatly how do you wrap your your hands around not only a tree mm -hmm. right but but the fact that we're talking about something that's probably non-physical in nature and metaphysical, conceptually. You know, we're talking about philosophy here, metaphysics, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not, and there's nothing wrong with it. You just gotta just try to balance everything. You know, science, medicine, psychology, metaphysics, et cetera, et cetera, in a, a holistic whole, make it sound easy, impossible to do. You know, you know, thousands of scholars over many centuries have tried to figure out what consciousness is, and we still don't have an answer, nor do I. And it's kind of fun trying to trying to figure it out. You know, I, I like being curious and, and trying to answer, yeah. important, to provide answers to things that are relevant and most important in life. Not that we are successful. And sometimes it's very frustrating to do so in, mm -hmm. in the process, but, but yeah. We want facts, facts. Mm -hmm. I got a hundred billion neurons in my brain. They sit in a warm, dark bath. You know, it's three and a half pounds. Um, it, it operates using quantum physics um, and, and science I think is beginning to gain traction. And I think science is becoming more open-minded, acknowledging not only the facts about the brain and in this respect and more, but also, but also with respect that in order to comprehend consciousness we also have to understand maybe a non-materialistic dimension or dualistic understanding of the mind the answer is not only in this three and a half pound of of of, of tissue um, right. but but quantum processes we just recently discovered can function in, in a warm dark environment and that's what inside the skull is but here again, I, I I can't get you know I can't get beyond the, the the fact that we may very well you know may very well be be light beings, um, and and if we need to understand more the brain more in this respect, let's let, let's not discount the importance of of that in our overall equation, because in order to prove that we may very well be light beings, and I'd like to make a strong case for that, and I tried to earlier, we have to understand the brain better and, and realize um, how it can be a source of light energy and how it can possibly receive light energy externally and integrate that with neurological principles like neurotransmitters and integrate that with existing structures in the brain. And I think I think we're getting there. Mm. I think we're getting there. But you have to look at microtubules, mm -hmm. the biophotons that that provide the main signals and physical basis for um, it's called bioregulation. It's a form of electromagnetic uh, field, and it connects us. The thought is that these biophotons connect us with 
the environment and each other. So you make this kind of analogy between some physical system in the body that provides for physical interaction with some external object or human being, you know, like a, like the cellular version of ESP or non-locality is somewhere in your brain where you pick me up, not on your phone, but you pick me up by your thoughts. I think, you know, people like Musk are trying to go there, you know, where you can read each people's minds, but, you know, your, your employer can monitor your mind and make sure you're not mind wandering. Theoretically, that's a possibility. Not to, not to de decipher exactly what you're thinking, certainly an invasion of privacy, but more or less, you know, modulating your default, you know, your certain activity or, or EEG pattern in your mind to see if you're engaged in your work. That may be an ethical issue right then and there. Um, but I don't even want to go there in a sense. But getting back to light beings, we have to look at um, these kinds of processes and how the existing structures can be better understood to to better understand how they can generate light, like glial cells, which actually make up 90% of the brain. And we were mentioning this earlier. And there, these glial cells are thought to behave like these quantum computers. They monitor neuron, uh, neuron activity, uh, and they provide a critical, a critical role uh, with respect to electrical conduction in, in the brain. But we need to learn more about it. And for some reason, it's being largely ignored or studied in glial cells. And you put that all together. We have we have a lot, lot to consider when we look at humans as being potential light beings. So you brought up something. It's almost like glial cells, microtubule, and crystals are the paranormal as perhaps the hippocampus was to memory. You know, we have a structure that could, you know, equate across from our senses into, you know, having long-term and short-term memory. I love what you're saying, Bob. Are you, is that one of the messages I hope you're in, in your film? Or do we have to do another podcast just on oh, No, I, I, I ascribe to it. Uh, another neuroscientist, Diane Powell, ascribes to it. Um, nice. uh, I'm not sure where Tom Campbell ascribes to it, but it is certainly an aspect of consciousness. Um and um, that has quantum processes associated with it, and, and very likely a simulated virtual reality associated with it too. Not certain, can't speak on his behalf, but um, you can look at, you even can look at, like you mentioned the pineal gland, uh, which, which excretes dimethyltryptamine, DMT, the active ingredient in ayahuasca. You can even look at the brain uh, in terms of its possible physical structure as, as a system that's purposely designed to capture energy externally. Um, think, of the, think of the brain, how, how should I express this? Think of the brain um, head on. Okay, you're looking at me, but, but remove the skull, you see the brain. Okay? Tilt the brain up like this. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture, but and try to imagine what what the image would look like. Yeah, you got you got to cut away a little bit more, but you get to a, a part where the pineal gland is, and 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 then you have those cavities too on the big cavities on on either sides of of the corpus callosum, which is band of fibers. Point is, point is, the structure looks like. Um, uh, it it looks it it looks like it's a structure that would capture energy. It looks What's... like it would be perfectly designed to 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 capture um, energy externally, and and the way it channels, and the way it is structured, the way it protects the pineal body, the pineal gland is perfectly centered in the brain, externally well protected, most protected of any structure in the brain. And there's something quite unique about the pineal gland. We understand a little bit, certainly, about it. But there's certainly more we don't understand. And that's to be said, obviously, of the brain entirely, especially how the brain integrates itself. And there are theories like the integrated information spirits theory, the global workplace theory. I don't want to elaborate on these theories about 
how the brain processes information and makes predictions, etc. Uh, but these theories exist and are beyond complex and are only theoretical. That can't be proven, just like the many, you know, the, the, the many worlds theory and the extra dimension theories, uh, all of that. Uh, you, you know, you don't know who or what to believe. And that can be said of any any theory, certainly. And how do you then look at all these existing theories that you need to prove in order to evolve into a new paradigm shift? Uh, because you need to prove, right, that the yeah. Earth orbits the sun. Mm -hmm. You need something dramatic to be learned yeah. to prove something major that alters a major aspect of, of our perception of the world. Likewise, something is going to happen um, that's going to result in our becoming aware of, not how we evolve around the sun, but something about consciousness and, and how we interact with reality and, and the power of the mind. And I do believe that there's, there's a lot more there if, if we understand it better and treat it in the way that it should be as early on in life as possible. And we don't understand how to do that. A long right. way, unfortunately, from, from, from benefiting um, from some of the techniques we're learning today. I don't have any um, follow-up questions. It's just taking taking in the amount of information and then placing it in the spots that work for me. You know, that's it. Yeah, well, Bob is just, he, we haven't even touched the wealth of his information. It's just I, crazy I know. how much he knows. Yeah. So Bob, I, Natasha and I want to thank you again for your time for yes. the show. And um, so I'm going to ask you two things. One, anything that you haven't discussed Best or would like the audience to know and to how do they contact you so you can talk about your website the film or email or whatever you'd like well again thank you both for um for speaking with me and um uh, I, i'd like to simply share that that uh a little information about our film uh, certainly about consciousness and in all matters related to it extraordinary human experiences we have many leading scholars in the field and and maybe as or more importantly many people like donna uh, ribadell who's who's had um, a near-death experience and we interviewed her at the monroe institute um, to integrate essentially with with the science that's and the theories that are shared with us by those we interviewed there so we um we anticipate that it will be done by mid to late uh, 2025 and much more information about about the film and our participants um, on the GoFundMe page um, and we also have a, a YouTube website where we have short videos of of the interviews that we conducted during our two-year travel across the country interviewing you know over 40 people um, but the website for the film is consciousnessfilm.info. That's consciousnessfilm.info. Um, and please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel again for, for uh, updates on, on the film. And my personal website is bobdavisspeaks.com. And uh, um, I'd be happy to uh, communicate with you. Uh, my email is davisri57 at yahoo.com. I'd uh, be happy to hear from you. So again, Donna and Natasha, thank you. Thank you so much for, for speaking to me. And more importantly, for, for speaking to so many people who further speak to so many more. And and the word gets around. And, and it can only be done with, with people like you. And unfortunately, we need, we, you know, there aren't as many, you know, great podcasts with wonderful people speaking, speaking the right word, uh, the right word, to as I think. Uh, to to people who are truly curious and, and on their journey. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bob. Thank Thanks. you, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We publish our Exploring Consciousness podcast on the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of the second week of every month. Please check the podcast schedule and more on our companion website, exploreconsciousness.com. Thank you again for listening.